there. I think I've started recording. So um, I'm going to put the recording of this uh, both on the UNM website and on YouTube. So this is going to be a hybrid class. And in fact, I'm thinking of running the class till quarter of seven to make up for the snow day yesterday. Um, if uh, people have any comments on that, um, please put a comment there in the chat session. Um, okay, so one person has to leave at 6.30, so maybe we should, maybe we should end at 6.30. Um, let's see, the question about audio here. I believe that, um, I believe the audio is working. Uh, Um, it's kind of crazy um, during this pandemic. Uh, so this is going to be a hybrid class today. Um, we're going to end at 630, but we're going to, I'm going to try to go through some new material to make up for the fact that we had a snow day yesterday. Um, anyone from the northern states must be amazed that yesterday was a snow day. Um, I can just imagine what somebody who lives in, who's from Buffalo or even more so Nova Scotia would think about having such a snow day. But anyway, um, let me go on with the mathematical physics. Um, last time, well, uh, I mentioned that um, uh, the unboundedness of the eigenvalues of a differential operator, in particular of a self-adjoint dif differential operator, um, uh, were important. Obviously, they're important, but they have a secondary importance in that because they um, because these, um, when these eigenvalues go to infinity, then the eigenfunctions are complete. And that's something I want to go through today. So we've got a question here. Why not do that next week? That makes everyone have time to prepare. I don't understand the comment because you don't have to prepare for one of my classes, you just have to sort of listen. Um, so I'm, I'm a little confused. But as I said, this is a hybrid class. So if you want to ask questions, ask questions. If you want me to do particular examples, ask me to do particular examples. Um, if you want help with the homework problem, tell me about that. What was that? Let's see, I, I didn't quite hear that. Um, in any event, one, it, it's, it's, it might be easier to use the chat. Okay, good, somebody's using chat. Give a hint to do 7-7. Seven, seven. All right, let me remind myself what 7-7 seven, seven is. Um, so this would be problem seven, seven. I didn't realize that I assigned seven, seven. So this is the one with the gamma matrices, right? Um, okay, this, this is, uh, this business, these arguments from symmetry and anti-symmetry are trivial once you understand the trick and impossible when you don't understand the trick. So let me get out the trusty iPad and, um, oh God, um, okay. So here we go, let's see if I can do this. No, oh, I certainly don't wanna do that. Uh, let's go with this one maybe, and I'll start with black. Okay, so 
Um, what we've got then in this particular example is gamma A, gamma B. These are four by four matrices. Oh, let, let's see, you're not seeing this. Hold on, let me fix the screen here. Okay, there we are. So we've got these four by four matrices. So these gammas are four by four matrices. Um, and what I want to say is that DA, DB uh, is just a, a differential operator that's identically zero. Well, the easy way to do this is um, to put in uh, um, particular numbers. So suppose we said A equal to one, B equal to two. Then this expression here is gamma one, gamma two minus gamma two, gamma one. And then that's multiplied by D one, D two. Um, the, I, I guess what I, what's, what's uh, assumed here is that we're summing, we're summing here uh, over A, B going from zero to three. Um, and so in particular, when A is one and uh, B is two, we have this expression and um, actually, you know, now that I think about it, this thing is identically zero without the sum. So let's forget about summing for a moment here. All right, so you see, um, all right, this is a little trickier than I. Uh, no, actually, I think we are summing now that I think about it, because you see what we have to do is we have to consider also the case uh, A equal to two and B equal to one. So we would add to that gamma two, gamma one, gamma minus gamma one, gamma two. D1, D2, the, the, deriv the order of the derivatives doesn't matter, but if you want, I can um, make this super explicit here. And of course, these two derivatives are exactly the same. And now we see that these things exactly cancel. That cancels that, and this one cancels that one. And so the two are equal to zero. So what we've got, uh, in other words, here is is really a sum uh, a b equals uh, going from zero. Now hold on to three of um, gamma a gamma b d a d b identically zero. All right, I hope, um, well, I, I now see that I've done the whole problem as opposed to give you a hint, um, but um, that's probably uh, useful and maybe I should have made that problem a little more explicit. Um, so, um, so I'll try to do that. Um, I don't know, no matter how big I make my desk, it's never big enough. Um, things are always falling off. Okay, so um, until I get the next question, then I'm going to go on with this just a little bit. Um, we, uh, a couple of sections ago, we were talking about section, uh, this section here, seven. 35, and I hope I'm in the right section now. All right, so section 35, and 
there I defined um, functionals E and N. N is the norm function, E is an energy function. And um, what we saw was that um, if we took the ratio of E to N, um, and since E is quadratic, this this is equivalent to say, be saying that uh, it's equivalent to saying that we're just minimizing the energy function for a normalized state. Um, in any event, uh, that ratio then is uh, the the eigenvalue of lowest energy. The eigenfunction of lower lowest energy minimizes this ratio, and uh, then, and in fact, that ratio in that case if I recall, is just the um, eigenvalue uh, lambda. Um, so what one can do to find the second, uh, the, the eigenfunction for the uh, first excited state is you then look for the function that minimizes the ratio, but that is orthogonal to the ground state wave function. And, um, So uh, remember, this is the form of a, this is the storm Liouville equation uh, for an operator, a differential operator L in self-adjoint form. And uh, remember what you can do. Remember we went through the song and dance about a self-adjoint system and the self-adjoint system, uh, those conditions guarantee that uh, you can write um, chi star L psi, and that's the same as L on chi star psi. And so you have these e equalities here. The, in other words, in physics language, the differential operator is Hermitian. Um, so what we want to do now is look at the unboundedness of the eigenvalues. And the, the eigenvalues, once again, are these ratios, uh, the the eigenvalue um, lambda is the the low ground state at the lowest eigenvalue is the eigen is given by the ratio of these two uh, functionals over all functions that are in the domain of the of the uh, self adjoint system and um, that's r is then the ratio of the energy eigen the the energy to the norm and um, uh, so the, 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 the assertion that I made is that um, last time is that uh, we can drive these eigenvalues to infinity because all we have to do is put a lot more jitter in an eigenfunction or in a test function in a particular function and then uh, we'll get it to, um, we'll get the ratio to go to infinity and here's an example where uh, the lowest eigenfunction is just a uh, sine of x or, and um, the, uh, that is to say sine of x. And then we add to it a sm uh, one tenth times the sine of omega x where omega is of 200. Well, this thing has enormous energy because uh, when you look at the energy, you see you have the square of the derivative and P is positive. So this thing goes to infinity. So um, I just mentioned the Kuron Hilbert uh, proof that the eigenvalues go to infinity. And since that, that's eminently plausible, um, I think we can just uh, accept it. Um, by the way, since we were talking for a moment there about gamma functions, let me, let me just mention, not gamma functions, uh, gamma matrices. Let me just mention a word about these gamma matrices. The gamma A is four by four, and it's in general complex. And the basic thing that it is, is the, uh, the defining equation for it is that the anti-commutator of two gamma matrices, which is to say gamma A gamma B plus gamma B gamma A is equal to twice the metric of um, flat space-time, which is to say two 
times minus one, 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 with zeros everywhere else. So um, that's that's what uh, the gamma matrices are doing. And so any set of four, four, four by four matrices that satisfy this condition are a suitable set of gamma matrices. Of course, many uh, people use the opposite convention and they have uh, eta, they use eta prime, which is just minus eta. Um, a, in particle physics, that's more common, um, but uh, the leading particle physicist, I think these days is Steven Weinberg and he uses the, uh, I'm following his convention of having, it's better to have three plus signs and one minus sign than one plus sign and three minus signs. Um, also for general relativity, the metric, the Weinberg metric is uh, enormously preferred because it, distance then is the three pluses for um, uh, the uh, space directions. Okay, so let me get on to this completeness of the eigenfunctions. We're gonna assume that the eigenvalues go to infinity if you um, order them uh, in uh, ascending order then um, as the index goes to infinity, the eigenvalue goes to infinity. And I'm sorry if sometimes I misspeak and say eigenfunction when I mean eigenvalue. Um, so let's define two new, let's slightly generalize the energy and norm eigen, eigenfunctionals uh, in this way. E of fg is going to be p of x, an integral from a to b of p of x times the first derivative of f of x times the first derivative of g of x plus q of x times the function f of x, g of x. And the norm is basically this second term with q replaced by rho. And so these are defined for any functions in the domain. And if we integrate EFG by parts, what we do is we get this and a boundary term. We integrate again and we just get F self adjoint. Well, here we are F um, P G prime prime plus F Q G. Well, this is just LG, F times LG. And then there's the boundary term. The boundary term vanishes when the functions are in the domain. And so E is just FLG. And um, the, uh, we can use the for, uh, first N, well, we can approximate, here's the deal. We approximate, God, I sound like Biden. <laughs> anyway, um, let's take, let's say we want to approximate an arbitrary function in the domain as a linear combination of the eigenfunctions. And what the, the point of this section is to show that we can actually do this. If we try to do it, well, the coefficients are kind of obviously going to be given by the norm of f with u. So in other words, they're gonna be an integral of rho times f times u. Um, and uh, what we've, what we're um, just assuming here, as you know, is uh, something that we showed earlier, namely that if we have a self-adjoint system and we have some eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, we can choose the eigenfunctions to be orthonormal with the norm defined uh, in, in uh, this way. All right, there's a question here. Okay, there's an interesting question. Um, I, I don't know the real, I, I don't have a full answer to that. That's something that I've occasionally thought about. Um, what generally happens in general relativity is instead of taking the gamma matrices and bringing them to life, 
by saying that um, the anti-commutator of two gamma matrices should be, so in other words, what the, the question being asked is, should we say that, um, let us say gamma I, gamma K should be two G I K, again, I K going from zero, one, two, three. Um, so this is 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 interesting. Um, let me tell you what is is. Uh, I think I, I I'd have to think it with with fingers and equations, and I don't want to take too much time there. But what one can do is, I suppose, is define gamma a gamma i as a Cartan, a sort of inverse Cartan. Uh, tetrad times the gamma matrices, and then um, then one would have that the gamma i gamma k uh, anti commutator would be then C i a C k b, the anti commutator of gamma a with gamma b, and then this would be. 2 CIA CKB eta, uh, let me get this straight now, eta AB. And in fact, I think this actually would be 2 GIK. Okay, so it's, it's, it's easy to do what um, w was being suggested. I'm, I'm treating you all anonymously. Um, because uh, we're going to put this on YouTube. Um, so you see, you can do that with these um, Cartan tetrads. The basic Cartan tetrad is that the metric of flat space is, uh, oh, sorry, hold on, let me get rid of that. It is uh, CIA, eta, AB, CBK, and um, one raises and lowers things with the appropriate metric and its inverse and so forth. So this is the metric of um, space time. And the metric of space time is that distances are GIK, DXI, DXK, and again, summed IK from zero to three. Okay, big distraction there, but I guess that's okay. Uh, so let's get back to the completeness business We've got our eigenvalues going to infinity. We've defined two new functionals and we see that the function, the energy functional is this. And now we want to approximate an arbitrary, we're going to use the first n orthonormal eigenfunctions of L with eigenvalues lambda k to approximate the an arbitrary function in the domain as this linear combination. And the coefficients you can see are given by uh, this expression. And um, let's see, is um, uh, I think that's kind of obvious. Uh, let me, it's, it's the same deal as, so let me shift now to a different color. It's, um, in other words, uh, what do I do? Let's take this integral from A to B of rho F UK DX. And um, I'm saying that that should be uh, CK. And uh, if we say that F is this sum, and I'm gonna have to write this as CJ UJ UK DX. But now these eigenfunctions are orthonormal. So this is um, rho CJ. No, there's no rho there. Delta JK. So let me get rid of the rho. Um, so that's. Uh, CK. So indeed, CK is given by this expression. 
This is the same razzmatazz that we used for Fourier series along in the beginning of the course. And so now what we want to show is that the rem that uh, this sequence, the CK, uh, the coefficient CK, eigen, the kth eigenfunction, that this converges to F in the mean, which is to say that um, the remainder function uh, is going to go to zero. The norm of the remainder function is going to go to zero. And um, so the first thing is that by construction, this remainder function is orthogonal to the first n eigenfunction. So in other words, we're approximating f by the first n eigenfunctions. And uh, the assertion is that the remainder is orthogonal to the first n eigenfunctions, assuming that we've chosen the coefficients correctly. And I actually did. I thought maybe there was a little um, that, that, that this was um, not quite so obvious. And so what I did was I added a section to the example section here. And so first of all, we assume the, the eigenfunctions are orthogonal. I should change basis to eigen there. Um, so let me just make a note to myself. Um, and um, so what is this norm, this norm that I'm saying is zero? Well, the norm, of course, by definition is the remainder times UK integrated with respect to rho from A to B. Um, on the other hand, the remainder is just the, by how much the approximation misses the function. And so it's rho integrated with the difference times UK. But um, rho f uk is just ck by definition. And rho uj uk is delta jk because these guys are orthonormal. And so this is just ck minus ck and that's zero. So this, this, so the remainder is orthogonal to the first k eigenfunctions. The next eigenfunction minimizes this ratio. Whoops, I, I just do not understand what's going on. These touch sensitive things are very, very touchy. Um, okay, so. So the next eigenfunction minimizes uh, this ratio over all phi that are orthogonal to all the, to the first n eigenfunctions. And um, that minimum is the n plus first eigenvalue. And so the n plus first eigenvalue is less than or equal to the, re, the ratio or the, the ratio of the energy to the norm of any function that's orthogonal to the first k eigenfunctions, any function in the domain that's orthogonal to the first k eigenfunctions. Well, one function that is orthogonal is Rn itself. And therefore we have that the norm of Rn multiplying by this, in, this inequality by n first, and then dividing by lambda, we get this equation that, the, that Rn, n, which is Rn squared, is less than or equal to e divided by lambda. So we're done if we can just show that this e of Rn is bounded as n goes to infinity. Well, that's a matter of um, bookkeeping. Uh, e of Rn, well, Rn is this different. I don't know what the hell it is. Uh, it's so annoying. Um, I guess this might be even worse for you than for me. Anyhow, um, Rn is just the is just uh, the error in the approximation of the function, the arbitrary function f, arbitrary function in the domain f, 
uh, the difference between that and the approximation CKUK. And if you multiply that out, this is a linear functional, so it's EFF, and then it's uh, CK times um, EFUK, uh, EUKF. And actually, now that I think about it, I should have really probably had a complex conjugation on one of these Cs, um, and also over here because this thing is, uh, uh, oh wait, no, we're in the real domain, aren't we? We're not doing things in the complex. All right, so this is all real. These are real functions. By the way, Julian Schwinger once in a uh, quantum mechanics lecture, he taught a marvelous course on quantum mechanics. And in one of his lectures, he, he said, um, you know, if, we, if it weren't for SU2, and the spin of the electron, we wouldn't need complex numbers in quantum mechanics. And um, as usual in a Schwinger lecture, uh, the students were copying down like crazy what he had written on the blackboard. There was no YouTube or anything like that in those days. And um, so, no, and the students were copying things down so much that, and so busy that they couldn't ask, and nobody could ask a question. And then at the end of the lecture, he would leave immediately um, and the students would still be copying. So there were very few questions in the Schwinger lectures. Um, and I never asked him uh, what he meant by that. Um, I, I, I since then have learned some of what he must have meant by that. And um, it's, it's something that I alluded to when I was in the chapter on eigenfunctions back in chapter one the section on eigenfunctions in chapter one. Um, and it's basically that, uh, yeah, the eigenfunctions pretty much, uh, you can take them to uh, typically real. Okay, anyway, um, of course you can take linear combinations that are complex. And um, the my own impression is that complex numbers are an intrinsic part of quantum mechanics and would be even if it weren't for SU2, but I don't know, Schwinger was a very smart man. So I have never come to a definite conclusion on that. Anyway, let's go on with this. It turns out we, we know that because the system self-adjoint EUF is the same as EFU, so we can just combine these two like that. And they're all in the domain of the system. So they satisfy the boundary conditions. And so we can say EFU is uh, EUF and so forth. So EFU is FLUK, and um, so, but on the other hand, LUK is lambda K, FUK, and um, uh, F, the, the integral of rho with U at times F, that just gives you CK. So this thing has just given us lambda K, CK. Um, and EUU is ULU, and that's this, and that's Kronika delta. If you put those two together, you find, after a little bit of easy bookkeeping, that the energy eigenfunctional of the remainder is the energy eigenfunctional of the function, the arbitrary function F in the domain, minus this quantity, which is the eigenvalues multiplied by the coefficients. And as lambda goes to, as n goes to infinity, lambda goes to plus infinity. So eventually this sum is positive. It could be that lambda one, lambda two, lambda 13 are negative. But as you go out to uh, k equal to a thousand or 10 to the 10th, whatever, uh, the lambdas start becoming positive and then they go to infinity. Um, so what we can say here then is that uh, this is basically positive, this sum, if you go high enough in N. So this energy of the remainder is the energy functional of the arbitrary function of the domain minus some positive number, which means it's less than or equal to the energy functional. So now we've bounded 
the energy of the remainder by the energy of the arbitrary function. And uh, we can then say, if we go back to this equation here, when we said we were almost done, namely that the norm of the remainder, in other words, the error, is the energy of the remainder divided by lambda n plus one. Well, if this is bounded by a bound that's independent of n, since these go to infinity, that's going to go to zero. And that's what, we've, uh, what we get here. Namely, that this Rn then is less than or equal, since, since this is less than that, we have that the remainder squared, the norm of the remainder is less than the energy of the arbitrary function of domain, which is just some particular number, divided by lambda n plus one. And as we said, n send n to infinity, this goes to infinity and the remainder goes to zero. So that means the eigenfunctions UK of a regular storm Liouville system are complete in the, main, in the mean in the domain D of the system. Okay, um, I haven't seen anything new on chat. Um, uh, I hope somebody, um, well, I, um, I invite questions. Questions are important. They guide me and inform uh, stu students. Um, Cora and Hilbert and Stackgold uh, go on to show other things, namely the eigenfunctions of a regular storm Liouville system form a complete orthonormal set in the sense that every function that satisfies Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions and has a continuous first and piecewise second derivative may be expanded in the series. And the series converges absolutely and uniformly on the interval. So that's not something that I showed. I just did um, convergence in the mean, but they show uh, something much more rigorous here. And uh, I don't think we have to prove everything in the physics department. Um, we would, uh, this discussion now of the completeness that I went through re relied upon the eigenvalues go to in, going to infinity and um, and the fact that uh, the boundary terms would vanish um, and the self-adjointness of the um, the self-adjointness of the uh, differential operator and the differential system. Um, now, what was essential was the vanishing of the boundary terms. And this can happen if P vanishes at the endpoints or if the functions in the domain all go to zero as X goes to infinity on an infinite domain. And so the results of this section that I was quoting just as uh, uh, applying to a finite interval from A to B um, have been extended to singular storm Liouville systems made of civil joint differential systems that are singular only because the infinite is the interval is infinite or the uh, function P vanishes at one end or at both ends. Um, and um, what, what we can see from all this is that the eigenfunctions of a storm Liouville system provide a representation of Dirac's delta function, which is of course really a functional as a sum like this. And um, this uh, expression would look like this. It's uh, delta of X minus Y is the, the weight function of the storm Liouville system raised to some power alpha, somewhere alpha somewhere between zero and one times another function rho. So the key thing is that the weight function comes in with uh, strength one. Um, and the reason why it doesn't matter what alpha is as long as alpha is in this interval is that uh, this sum here is non-zero only when x equals y. Otherwise, if x is different from y, this sum vanishes. Um, what I see that I may have not made so absolutely clear here is that is why this is um, such a an expansion. So let me see if I can do this 
on the fly. So let me um, grab, say, the red color. And um, OK, so what we're, we're saying here is that f of x, we're saying, is a sum a k. Well, I, I think I used u c k before, but uh, like this. So these are the eigenfunctions. The eigenfunctions and these uh, a k are the coefficients. But we, we have a formula for the AKs, namely that AK is an integral dx a to b in this particular case, sum of course on k um, equals whatever, one to infinity. Um, this is dx rho uk of x f of x. And so now if we substitute Oh, hell, you can't see this. Hold on. <sighs> Sorry. Thank you for the comment. Uh, I'm, trouble is the whiteboard. Um, all right. So if we substitute in there, what we get is that f of x is equal to a sum k equals one to infinity of, oh Christ. UK of X times the integral, and I'm gonna change X to Y in this expression. So I'm gonna call it dy because this was an X here. Okay, now, um, if we, you allow me to um, interchange summation and integration, and I don't want to really go through that razzmatazz here. Um, I'm going to write this this way. And this is going to be then a sum, k equals one to infinity. Um, Row of y, I don't need to have, row can be outside the sum, of course. Uh, uk of x, uk of y. So now what do we have? We have that f of x is equal to an integral of f of y times something or other. But of course, that's exactly the equation that we, um, that's dy, f of y, delta of x minus y. So the conclusion is that delta of x minus y is the sum k equals one to infinity. Uh, and let me put rho of y out here. Uk of x, uk of y. So since this is, since this right hand side is um, obviously only non-zero when x is equal to y, it doesn't matter whether we call this rho of x, rho of y, whatever. We could have called this uh, rho of x sum k equals one to infinity uk of x, uk of y. And so consequently, we can uh, generalize to an arbitrary power. And um, this is really quite interesting, I think. And um, uh, so um, I did a numerical example for uh, using the Bessel functions, Bessel's representation of the delta function. So Bessel's, uh, uh, Bessel's uh, the Bessel equations, uh, the equations of Bessel functions form a, an infinite set of storm Liouville systems. And each system is characterized by an integer n. Unfortunately, n always shows up as an integer. And uh, I mean, we're overusing the, 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 the letter n. In any event, the nth Bessel system has this uh, Sturm-Liouville differential equation. 
the weight function is just x. And the eigenvalues are z, are, are z squared sub nx. These z sub n and k are, are the zeros of the Bessel function, the nth Bessel function j of x. Uh, we'll get to that later in the course if we don't have too many snow days. Um, by the way, a uh, friend of mine um, uh, whose father was in the British Navy uh, during the Second World War um, told me that uh, his father told him that during the Second World War, the values of ZNK were military secrets in Britain. And um, so I, I think that um, you should appreciate that when we do the Bessel functions um, uh, at the end of the year, uh, at the end of the semester, uh, you'll be learning what were military secret, sec secrets during the Second World War, presumably because of their use in radar. Uh, by the way, Schwinger was a main, a major figure in the development of radar in the United States. Um, he was invited to help make the atom bomb, but um, he said he'd rather work on something that would shorten the war in Europe, which of course was the important war. The Pacific War was um, something that we were going to win without any question. There was never any question of that. But the European War was more serious. And in fact, Stalin did more to beat the Germans than we did. Anyway, um, let's get back to this. Um, so the weight function is just x, and these eigenfunctions that are orthonormal with that weight function turn out to have this peculiar form. And so we can represent the delta function then this way, where these are the eigenfunctions. And if we set, if we use the simplest case where n is zero, then we set n there equal to zero, and this sum over k is the is the uh, this corresponds to uh, what we're talking about here in the uh, the uh, I don't know why we have to have whoops why we have to have this. Um, all right, never mind. Anyway. So I plotted this using uh, MATLAB and I did the first 10,000 terms of the series. And I did it for three values of alpha um, and three values of y. So the first case was alpha equal to zero. So then um, we just have a row of y and I chose y equal to 0. 0.47. And then the second case, I chose alpha equal to a half and y equal to a half. And the third case was alpha equal to one, y equal to 0.53. And the plot is over here. And um, so you can see the, the there are various things going on here. If you took a function and integrated it over here, you see the contribution would be entirely focused at this point here. 0.47 or 0.5 or 0.53, depending on which sum you used. In other words, what value of y you used. Uh, notice the scale. This goes from essentially minus a half to, well, a little bit less than a half to a little bit more than a half. And this goes from zero to 10,000. Um, so if the function is at all smooth, these wiggles up and down mean that the integral uh, washes out and the contribution is zero. And then you get a huge contribution for x equal to y. Um, so that's the sense. And so I, I actually, um, this mathematical physics became much, became much more real to me when I um, did these numerical examples in uh, MATLAB. Um, I, and I hope they help you as well. Um, uh, inequalities of Bessel and Schwartz. Well, obviously this integral is positive. And uh, if you just massage this a little bit, you get what's called Bessel's inequality, which is that the norm of the function f 
is greater than or equal to the sum of its coefficients. And one can then take the Schwartz inequality for vectors, apply it to functions, and we get a we get this inequality here, which is that the the square of the norm of the function f times the square of the norm of the function g is greater than or equal to the uh, square of the inner product of f star with g. Um, okay, so the next topic here is Green's functions. We're down to um, uh, uh, only 10 minutes left. So if somebody has a request, in other words, stop what you're doing and uh, it wants to say that I should stop what I'm doing and focus on something else. Now's the time to put it on the chat screen. Um, okay, so Green's functions, and this is uh, here we're repeating um, uh, things we've said before, but in a slightly different way or a different context. And this stuff is so important in physics that it doesn't hurt to repeat it. Um, so suppose X is a is short for X1, X2 up to Xn. And uh, the differential <clears throat> The, the Green's function for the differential operator L is something such that when L hits the Green's function, you get the delta function. And there are various examples of that. And one is uh, just the ordinary delta function that um, the delta function in three dimensions and uh, so the, the, we want minus Laplacian or minus the divergence of the gradient of G to be delta cubed of X. Um, we can use this to express the scalar function in Coulomb gauge uh, by the Green's function integrated over the charge density, because then you have minus Laplacian on phi, the scalar potential is minus Laplacian on the Green's function, that's a delta function. And that just gives us uh, Gauss's law. This minus Laplacian of phi, of course, is um, grad. That's the divergence of E because E is minus the gradient of phi. And um, A has no divergence, so the divergence of A vanishes. That's why people like the Coulomb gauge. The downside of the Coulomb gauge um, is that. Um, it's not a Lorentz invariant gauge. On the other hand, the Lorentz invariant gauges have their own downsides. And um, uh, there are, well, I'm not gonna do the philosophy of this, so let's, let's skip all that. Um, so what is this green fu Green's function? Well, we write it as a Fourier transform. We know the delta function has this Fourier transform. So we just require that minus Laplacian on G be delta. So that's minus Laplacian on this. Laplacian pulls down K squared, that's equal to that or that. And that tells us that little g of K is just um, uh, one over K squared two pi cubed. And so G is this Fourier transform. And if you do the integral as we did back in this section um, or I don't know if we did it back then, but anyway, if you do the integral, uh, you get one over four pi r. And so this is the standard uh, Coulomb potential. Um, there, of course, are many other uh, uh, important differential equations. One is the Green Green's function for the Helmholtz equation where we'd have minus, instead of minus Laplacian V equals rho, we'd have minus Laplacian minus M squared V equals rho. And um, this then gives us, uh, you, you can show, if you go through the same steps, you can show that the Green's function of the Helmholtz equation is this. Uh, another Helmholtz equation has an opposite sign on M squared. And uh, you can show that that's a Yukawa potential. And, um, of these equations, uh, of course, the 
really the one that's probably the most important is the ordinary Coulomb potential. And um, it has an expansion in terms of spherical harmonics. You've, of course, seen this, uh, so I'll just mention it. Um, and that allows us then to write the scalar potential, which is then an integral of the Green's function with the charge density. It then looks like this. And these things are the multiple, these integrals give us the multipole moments. So we can define QML as this. And then the scalar potential gets this very nice form here. So this, of course, works if the charge density is localized within some sphere and uh, you integrate in the sphere and then you're looking at the potential outside the sphere. And so then this is a rapidly converging uh, sequence because uh, it goes as one over R to the L plus one. Um, spherical harmonics let us expand uh, the uh, Legendre polynomials in this way. And then that gives us a simpler expression, a simpler expression for the, uh, for the Green's function, namely it's, uh, uh, our, it's a sort of a Sermon on the Mount uh, formula, R lesson, R lesser to the L divided by R greater the L plus one times PL. Um, Feynman's propagators and other Green's function is the Green's function for one of uh, something closely related to the um, Helmholtz differential operator, uh, but we're in four dimensions now. And um, if you uh, integrate over Q0 and you use uh, what we learned about I epsilon rules, uh, you can find that you can express the Feynman propagator in terms of this function and uh, well, in terms of this function, which is a Lorentz invariant function, this is a Lorentz invariant measure. This is a Lorentz invariant inner product, and you get this expression here. Okay, I think we better quit now. Be or if there's unless there's a question. Well, we've got two minutes, three minutes left. So let's see. When actually, no, this class is supposed to end at five twenty. Uh, right? Isn't that right? It's 5.30 to 6.20, I think. Yeah, all right, so I'm already over time. I think I should stop. Um, so um, let me just remind you, I sent you all an email today mentioning, um, giving you a link to a new class website that uh, Tom Hess has made available. Um, I think this will be a lot easier for you than using the UNM website. I will still put the, um, the the 468 videos are will, will still be uh, MP4 files on the um, uh, class of the UNM website, um, but uh, the links to YouTube now will be uh, on the uh, new website, um, which um, well, if you look at your email, you see you've got the the link and it's a much shorter link than that absurd link that the UNMIT people, I don't know what they're thinking of when they give you a link that's uh, uh, two, 300 characters long. Um, I don't know what they're thinking about. Anyway, um, so stay out of bars, uh, stay safe and um, uh, we'll have class again tomorrow. So I'm gonna end it now. Um, let's see, stop, share. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And